So now that we've done that, so I know that mobility was a thing that we all wanted to discuss here and sort of how that is impacting how I'm sort of thinking about mobility, which is really fun because mobility is crazy right now. Um, so um, we'll get into that probably in this section. So um, just want to talk a little bit about things that we do around sustainable location of our buildings. Um, a lot, some of you are studying civil engineering. We uh, really rely on our civil engineers when we're doing things like remediating a brownfield. So this is a project that just got LEED Platinum. LEED, is this something that we've heard of or do I need to explain that? Raise your hand if you've heard of LEED before. Okay, LEED is a great, nice, um, is, a is a green building certification and basically is like the language that you use to explain to the world, it stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And it's run by the US Green Building Council. Um, and it's really hard to get. Um, and so this project, 100 Hooper, just got its like highest level LEED Platinum certification just a couple weeks ago. Um, but it's under mediated brownfield. Whatever activities that happened here, I think there was like a dry cleaner and like some other stuff that contaminated all of the soil. Um, that all has to get fixed. We rely on engineers to help us deal with all of that. Um, and so that's, that's really important. Okay, now we're gonna get into the mobility. So I'll stay here for a while, happy to answer any questions about it. Um, alternative transit. So the other thing, obviously, that makes a building more sustainable is fewer people driving to it, right? Um, and this world is changing super, super quickly. Um, so this is a project that we're building, I'm sorry it's so hard to see, but project we're building in Seattle right now. Um, and people in Seattle are like super into their bicycles, right? Um, I'm somebody who, oh, Thank you, um, but don't go to sleep. Um, who um, who bike who do a lot of biking to work? And it's funny. I was just in Copenhagen for a climate summit, um, and like I've never seen more bicycles in my entire life. Like I love a bicycle, but like dang, the weather is terrible in Copenhagen, and they are still the Danish are super into it. Um, and so now one of the things we think about is like how do we really celebrate and embrace the bicycle? But probably one of the things that you guys are maybe interested in is how we're dealing with electric vehicle charging life. Is that of interest? No. Yes. Right, so the, there's been an explosion um, in electric vehicles lately, and it's a major thing because we don't know uh, at this point, and if anybody does know and can prove to me that they do, I will definitely hire you, um, which is we don't know what world we're gonna live in. We're either gonna move to a world in which cars are, we know cars are gonna become autonomous, that is happening, those cars are driving around, you guys are engineers into mobility, so obviously you know this. We don't know if we're gonna live in a world where everybody drives their own autonomous, or not drives, but everybody owns an autonomous vehicle, right? And they just get around and you just, you know, look at your, like, whatever the most updated, fancy heroin addiction phone that you can get. Um, or is it gonna be like Lyft and Uber where nobody owns a car? We don't know what reality we are going to be living in and that causes a whole lot of like, depression and angst in real estate because we don't know what kind of garages we're supposed to be building. Um, one of the things we're finding right now is, and we were in a state where like all my buildings have electric vehicle charging. I drove an electric car here, um, not a Tesla, which I could afford one. Um, but uh, we, so we're putting in, every building has some stations, two, three, six. That is not cutting it anymore. We had, we're having a, a tenant, I think this is publicly announced, Netflix is moving into our big campus in Hollywood. And they're like, yeah, we're, I was like, great, so we're putting in these 12 stations for you. And they're like, great, well, we will need another 97. Um, so this is a problem for me, right? Because I love being an electric car, obviously I have one, but this is causing a lot of grief because we don't have the electric power in most of our buildings to support that kind of infrastructure. LADWP currently thinks that the amount of power that it is going to have to produce, even as it's trying to meet the state's renewable energy goals, is gonna to have to double just to deal with the electrification of transportation. And we don't know if we're supposed to have bigger garages where like say everybody doing your deliveries and everything is trying to charge up in your garage and that's a great revenue stream or like no one will own a car and then you don't need a garage anymore and then you have to be able to convert the space. Um, so we literally have no idea what's gonna be happening right now. The way that we're solving it, which I think is, I hope it's smart, is that we're paying a whole lot of extra money up front to um, basically make our garages a little more convertible. Um, so as you guys probably know, the lightest thing you can put on a floor is cars. Um, so cars are the lightest thing, right? And then data center stuff like servers and whatnot, and then people. People are the heaviest things that can go in. So converting from cars to people is, often garages couldn't possibly do that, um, but we can do, and nobody's gonna, most of our parking is underground because that's more sustainable. So you don't have these big giant parking garages messing up the like pedestrian experience. 
Um, so like this thing has like four levels of underground parking. Well, nobody's going to want to like live or work in a cave. Um, and so if we start, if we end up not needing the parking, we're probably going to want to con convert it to some sort of data warehousing storage thing, especially with the advent of 5G is going to make real estate have to host a lot of those cell repeaters because they won't be housed in so many in data centers anymore. Anyway, can I, so that's sort of the world of electric vehicles, which is like, it's pretty scary right now. And we deal with other things within mobility. Like I just saw in your, um, uh, in your Insights um, magazine that uh, one of your um, alums worked on the Wilshire Grand downtown. Did you guys know that the Wilshire Grand is gonna have autonomous valet starting in July? Yeah, so if you have an electric car, um, it has to have a Wi-Fi signal. If you wanna, if you're fancy and you wanna park at the Wilshire Grand, like you just get out of your car and the Wilshire Grand takes over your car and parks it for you with no people. That is, that is happening like next year eight months from now, Not, wait, it's nearly November, so I'm gonna, yeah, eight months from now. Um, which is, which is this is, so this is a right now thing um, that's happening, and so we don't know, like, do we have to deal with autonomous valet? Like, are we gonna have to put those kind of systems in? Like, how do you do that? What if your autonomous system hits somebody? Um, so these are all sort of major concerns that real estate is dealing with. Um, before I move on, does anybody have any specific burning questions about mobility or anything I completely didn't touch on that they would like answered? Yes. Uh, so what about the off-grid buildings that they can provide their own energy? Supply? Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get there in a second. Actually, very, very soon. Actually, not very soon, but soon. Soon enough. But yes, because we will talk about that. Um, so anyway, so mobility questions, but yes. All right. So here's where we're going to go. So, so that's sort of location and things I think about in terms of how am I on time? Fine. Um, sustainability in location. So this is energy. This is our building um, uh, 350 mission in Salesforce, for Salesforce in San Francisco. Um, and it is a deeply energy efficient building. I can talk about why. Um, but the first thing we think about when we think, this is the boring stuff, uh, when we think about um, uh, being energy efficient in a building is lighting. Um, and lights are fascinating. There's a lot of um, work that's gone into lighting to make lights cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So I just had this happen this morning, where a project where I've been trying to do a lighting retrofit in a building, um, the cost of the lights was too expensive, I couldn't make it make or meet our financial um, requirements. And, that, and now, the next year, so that was last year, now this year, the lights have come down enough, meets it no problem. So the cost, the, what you're seeing a lot is because of a lot of great engineering and focus on manufacturing excellence, um, the cost of everything is plummeting right now. So it's a weird world because you don't know if like, do I do it now or do I wait? Like the incentives are better now, but the, but the technology is cheapest. I'm sure parts of you are centrally done. These are, these are chilled beam, um, which is a new fancy way of cooling a building where, the, where instead of having everything cooled centrally and then going out with chilled water everywhere, which is an inefficient way to do it, although the most common and cheapest, now we're piping other things through the building. So the cooling actually goes through um, these cooled beams that come out. Also, we're piping around refrigerant, so uh, what's called a variable refrigerant system. It's like the new fancy thing, and by new, I mean not remotely new. Japan has been doing it for like 25 years, but it's new to the state. So we feel modern even though it's not. Um, so mechanical system and mechanical design, another thing I think about a lot in my job to keep our buildings um, efficient. So glazing, obviously, how much your windows are allowing in the sunlight determines how much cooling your building's gonna have to do, especially here in Southern California when it's hot. So figuring out what kind of glazing we're supposed to be putting on to make it the most efficient while making it not ugly is really difficult. I spent a lot of time fighting with my architects because what is the most pretty thing? I mean, everybody wants something that looks like this, right? The things that just look like shiny, pretty princess diamonds, um, which are great, except like with all of that glazing, you let it in a whole lot of sun, and then you make the mechanical system have to work a lot harder. Like this building, which uh, I'm assuming was built not within the last year. Um, you notice how your windows don't come, like your what we call your window to wall ratio here is low, right? It's like in the probably 50%. Um, which is commonly how buildings are. This is a, actually a way more energy efficient design, right? It's cooler in here. This building struggles um, to, keep its, to keep itself having to, to spend too much energy cooling itself. 
All right. The other thing I deal with um, in terms of energy is daylighting. Obviously, the best light is the one that's not on at all. So we have, for example, this is a great example. We have enough light in the room for the task at hand, right? If you had the prof you, your professor was teaching and trying to write things on the board, this is not enough light. Given that we're looking at a presentation, it's plenty of light. There's a lot of engineering that goes into figuring out how to, how to let enough light in your space. And there's all sorts of fancy equipment to like keep bouncing light off the ceiling so it gets farther into the interior. Um, to uh, um, to fully light a building so you don't need to have the lights on particularly often during the day. Like the sun is great, right? Right? We like sun. Um, the more you can get it into the center of the building, the better. This is actually an example, I thought you'd like this, of a total failure in lighting, uh, in daylighting. Like there was way fuller and with your battery um, because of how the incentive structure works. Now, I did my deals because we're sort of forward thinking on this like f three and four years ago. Like this solar just got interconnected two weeks ago. These, bat whoa, these batteries here got interconnected last November. So this is pretty early generation of what's happening. And so what you're talking about is a microgrid, a standalone microgrid. This is the new kind of, it's not even new, but this is something that it continues to come up, especially as we deal with everything being on fire, right? Like the idea of being able to island your property away from burning electrical lines, so you, you know, you're at reduced risk and you're on during PG&E's you know, endless rolling blackouts is something that's now becoming very, very attractive. It's not something we do very well. So actually the best work that's sort of done unsurprisingly in microgrids is military because um, the Army, dis no, was it the Air Force? Do not quote me on if it was the Army or the Air Force and they don't like being mistaken for each other. I'm pretty sure it was the Army. Um, decided that the Maryland, uh, Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland, that utility was unreliable, and so they decided to make their own microgrid there, and so a lot of that knowledge is what has sort of trickled down to, to real estate. Um, and so it's not commonly done, except in things like you know hospitals or things where people are on respirators and they can't, really can't handle being off-site. Um, it's something that I'm thinking about, though, um, because we are in a state of where climate change like has already happened and it's just getting worse, and we want to protect our assets and have and have a tenant think, hey, if I work in one of you know Sarah's buildings, then they would, I'm more likely to be able to do my business. So anyway, solar is a major thing. We get around the tax issues by transferring our tax credits to somebody else, which is ugly and it's not a pleasant way to do things, but it's what we have to do. <coughs> right now, what's sort of happening is kind of crazy in solar. Because this is, you know, nice, it looks like a lot of solar, and it kind of is, you know, it's like close to half a megawatt on that building. But of all of Kilroy's energy use, our on-site solar is about five megawatts, which to put that into perspective is about half a percent of my energy use, which is kind of lame. So now what we're doing is we have done an off-site deal. So now the big thing in solar is like, okay, this is all nice and pretty and makes, like, makes good photos. But what you really need is to just and 100% renewably power all your buildings. How are you gonna do that? You're not gonna do that with only on-site solar because you would need solar things that look like this, right? Where the solar panels are this big and your building is this big because there's just not enough space unless you have like one story warehouses. So what people are doing now is being like, okay, I'm gonna do a deal for like 84 megawatts of solar in our case that's somewhere else. And basically the idea is I am taking as much energy um, as much energy as I take off the grid, I'm putting back on in terms of renewable power. So as a result of that, we will be carbon neutrally operating by the end of next year. And we're seeing more and more real estate companies sort of follow suit in one way or the other. So solar is great, but it doesn't always happen on buildings anymore. Yes. Does it just include solar or do you plan to use other sustainable energy tools like wind or biomass yeah. or whatever? Such a good question. Um, I looked at a bunch of wind deals, and the best deal for us was with solar. I don't, I don't care. I'm technology agnostic. I don't believe in urban wind. Um, actually, through a project in business school I did with the engineering department, where it's like, because you know, wind turbines, like their efficiency is related to the um, cube of their diameter, right? So when you make those things small, they become like hilariously inefficient. Um, but big turbines are great. But so, we have so many of them. It's not just wind and solar. Right, there are. But it's who will give you a deal. So basically, the only two technologies out there. Although I just got a soil pitch recently, a soil carbon sequestration thing. But the idea is that I also I live in a world where I want my chief financial officer to like me, and so my offsite renewables projects are financially lucrative for us, which is great, right? Win-win, sustainability and saving the world and saving the bottom line, all super good. When you're just paying for sequestration, 
there's that's not it there's not like a there's not a revenue stream that comes from that so the real estate companies i know most of them have done wind deals few mm -hmm. have done solar deals that are offsite um but if there's some way to make a revenue stream off of soil or biomass or carbon capture or whatever the heck i'm super into the idea um algae supposed to be this fun fuel source that i like worked on in grad school for a while it still hasn't still is always 18 months away from being commercially viable um it's only been a decade um so yeah i'm we're open but it needs to make sense and to make sense the problem is like as you all well know like how do these things get financed even this one right because i don't own it it's a bank and banks are not known to be or they are known to be risk-taking, but not in the right way. So they don't like financing new technology, especially not on a super big scale. And so, like, even just, even just like, utility-scale PV was hard, right? They all only wanted the concentrating solar forever, which was silly, right? It's like the equivalent of, like, you know, when you have, like, the magnifying glass and you're trying to kill an ant. Like, that's what you're doing with concentrating solar power. So even just getting utility-scale PV to happen, like, our offsite thing will be, was, like, a big deal. Um, and so, yeah, it's hard to get something, it's hard to get something cool financed. Basically, it's everything is off the shelf, and if you have the finance right. for that, right. you don't invest. For example, if you are building a big complex, you don't invest on different areas. Right, because I can't take the tax credits. So I need other people to invest, and then I, then I end up with weird financial arrangements with those people so that we're balancing the risk between us. Thanks. So like for solar, like it's a power purchase agreement, right? So like somebody else built it, bought it, owns it, and I'm just paying a price of power for, for it. Anyway. As opposed to the offsite deal, which is completely different. That's a not to get all financy, but that's a that's a hedge, right? So like, if the power goes above a certain amount, they cut B checks. If it goes below a certain amount, we cut them checks. So we're basically gambling on the future price of power. So I hope I'm right. Um, batteries. Um, so we have now batteries installed on nine sites um, in our portfolio. Um, Batteries are really interesting right now because um, overall, as we know, in order to get our grid to 100% renewable, you can't get there without storage. However, like battery technology um, is like still pretty nascent, right? The problem is we keep having batteries kind of explode in places like Arizona. It happened, I think, last year in a bunch in Korea. And so um, there's a lot of concern when you're trying to put one in with like fire protection. The fire department tends to freak out. I went to an energy conference early, earlier this year. My favorite quote was liar, liar, battery supplier, um, because um, the, those, and not Tesla, um, but the, the, own, the manufacturers of the ones that have exploded haven't really explained under what conditions that happen, and so people feel uncertainty about it. So batteries are kind of funky right now because we actually have no idea if any one particular battery is helping the planet, we know overall that we must have storage to get the grid to 100% renewable because the sun has this terrible habit of going down every night. But, but yet, an individual battery, like only what it's doing is it's charging. It's it's charging up when power is cheap, and then the building is running off the battery when power is expensive. But whether it's cheap doesn't mean it's the dirtiest power, and whether it's expensive doesn't mean it's the cleanest power. That used to be true, but things are kind of crazy in the energy markets right now. So we know we're overall kind of doing the right thing globally, but whether or not any this individual battery is helping with this particular building's carbon footprint, literally not even the battery company knows. We just get a revenue stream from it, so we're happy. And I think it's the right thing to do. Um, you can't put on a bunch of solar. And you know, as you know, we already have places in California that overproduce on solar. Giant chunks of San Diego overproduce, as does Northern California, and it's happening in small pockets in the LA region. And so unless you have the storage, it's putting on more and more solar isn't doing anybody any good. All of Hawaii um, is solar powered during the day, and then the sun goes down, and oops. So storage is important, but again, it's new. And the other thing about batteries is that the prices come down 85% in like the last five years, and so like, the battery projects themselves are like trying to just figure out how the financing should work while the incentives are still there is a whole thing. Anyway, happy to answer any questions on batteries. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about water. Eh, how am I doing? Okay, I'll speed through this. Um, you know, I saw a lot in here about water reclamation and your posters, so we're, we are doing with that as well. So this, this building has a gray water system, right? So we're using the shower and the sink water and recycling and it gets used in toilet flushing. Um, obviously, landscaping needs to be really drought tolerant. We haven't xeriscaped yet, um, but I'm trying to figure out how to do that. 
Um, I also will never go a professional day in my life without talking about urinals at least once. Um, we love us some low flow fixtures and are doing, like the engineering around these things is crazy. Like we love waterless urinals um, at Kilroy, but like making it all work in a way that's not uh, gonna explode or eat through copper piping and cause an unholy mess is tricky. And now the next thing is water use. This is me and I am drinking treated black water. Yep, I did, it tasted fine uh, and I didn't get sick. So, um, so that's the next thing that we're really contemplating is how to take all of the water, um, toilet water, sink water and shower water, recycle it to drinking quality standards on site, not off site, um, to reuse in everything on the campus. So this is a, this is actually, I'm in New York. Um, there's a project in Battery City there called the Solaire um, with apartments that none of us could afford. Um, that has been, this system is 15 years old. Like they've, they've had this going for a long time. It's fine. It doesn't even smell unless you open the intake tank cover thing um, and then it smells. Um, but then, and then, you know, it's fine. So, um, so we're fighting the fight on this right now. Right now, Google, Microsoft, Salesforce, and Facebook I hope I got those right, they're not here, um, are all racing to be the first to get a working Blackwater system in their buildings. This, this is happening right now and everybody's very excited about it. This went from like gross to sexy within the last few years. So I'm trying to figure out how to put it into one of my own buildings. And then talk a little about certifications. We mentioned LEED, I'll just quickly go through these. Um, so LEED is sort of the gold standard of, of all buildings. Um, so it, it deals with sites, uh, energy, materials, location, and indoor environmental quality stuff. <coughs> so when a building is deciding if it's gonna be really sustainable, this is how it would communicate that. But it's not the only one. Energy Star is another major thing. This is only on energy. This is run by the US EPA. Um, and we in LA, for example, have just let DC beat us in terms of the most Energy Star buildings. And obviously I'm, I'm from DC, so it's like I have mixed feelings, but obviously I want us to win. Um, and so this is based on a, like, it's strange because it's based on like this giant database of buildings and then that becomes like the average and then you get, you get a score based on how far above or below you are of that. This is like the fancy stuff. So if you ever find yourself in Santa Monica sometime next year and you want to go to the city services building, it is the first, it will be the first fully, I mean, it's not going to get its certification for a little bit, but it's going for it. Living building challenge building. So this is the fancy stuff. That building, you must be net positive energy. You must produce more energy than you use on site. You must be net positive water, which means not only you're recycling every drop on site, but you're also capturing dew. And you know, there's dew capture on the roof and you're using that too. Um, there is, it's even actually, and those things sound hard, but actually the harder thing is what it's doing on materials. Um, and I'll get into the, that in a second. And then there's other stuff around beauty and social equity and like all this craziness. So um, this is the most challenging thing. It's really hard for big buildings like the ones we build to get to living building challenge. Um, because uh, again, it's the, this problem with solar. Um, and so we've sort of struggled with this, but there are parts of it we can use. And it's really pushed the industry in terms of like those moon shots to like, let's figure out the best way to have a lot of energy on site. And let's figure, oh, and huge things on mobility and transportation stuff. Um, the other major focus is health and wellness. So I don't know if any, this is an area of interest of anybody, but it's something that we're really concerned about. Yes, I'm not gonna talk about the gyms and whatever, we all had flu shots yesterday. Um, but the real issue is air quality. So um, to like tangent slightly, the air that you breathe has this enormous impact on your cognitive function, like huge. And if you want to read more about that, it's the cogfxstudy.org. Um, I think it comes out of Harvard. Um, and like the and basically what they did is they took a bunch of people and they're like, hey, we're gonna have you work in this remote office. And they would do their regular jobs for eight hours, whatever, a day. And then they take a cognitive test at the end. Um, and it's, it, you had to be a mayor of a small town and pr making good decisions about, okay, you know, there's, there's a leak, what do I do about it kind of thing. Um, and what they found, and what, they, what the scientists were doing is manipulating the air quality, the, the CO2 levels and what are called the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds. Those are the off-gassing from paint and cleaning chemicals and stuff. And basically the difference was staggering between like a good day and a bad day. It's eight IQ points. 
um, about between like good air quality and bad air quality. I'm like, I don't know about you guys. Like I have two kids, I don't sleep enough. I need my, all my IQ points. I can't just give those up because the air is bad. Um, and a hundred person company would need to hire an extra six people if they have bad air just to make up for the productivity loss that the bad air is causing. It's a major concern and we're not in real estate good at measuring it. The sensors are not very good. Um, they are expensive, they break all the time, and they have to be calibrated constantly. So real estate in general, like you guys have no idea what the CO2 levels are in this room. Um, I should have brought my CO2 monitor from home, but, um, and it fluctuates wildly. So this is this whole major thing, which, which is we really need to be delivering better air, and we don't even know really how to do that or to get tenants to realize that that is something they should be demanding. Okay, Fitwell, this is the other side of good air. This is active design. So for example, um, I took an elevator to get here, but I think I could have taken stairs. Um, so that's an example of active design, right? Because the design allows me to be more active. This is where we get into mobility stuff. So and this, this is run by the Center for Active Design out of New York. Um, and it's things like, you know, do you have access to fitness? Do you have access to walking? Are there amenities close by? Like you're on a college campus, I'm sure there's all that sort of stuff. Everybody walks, that's great. Um, you know, how, how are we making the buildings? It's also like design, like, do you have a mother's room on site? So like somebody coming back to work is able to actually like live their lives. Like there's a lot that goes into that. So that's another certification we deal with a lot. Um, and this is, an, this is an example of like a fantastic active design, right? So this staircase is so darn beautiful in my building in Seattle that everybody wants to take it and they get more exercise. Well is another health certification. I won't get into it. This is my well certified building in Hollywood. We had to do a lot with air quality to get there. Uh, can't afford to live there either. Um, and now this is the thing, not this thing. These are health product declarations showing like every uh, in a material, everything that's inside. Um, but more importantly, wait, so this was the red list. Wait, I'll get back to these in a second. Red list free. So this was the thing I was talking about with living building challenge. This is the hardest thing, scariest thing, which is how do you find building materials that have been proven to be non-toxic to anybody? And you need like a degree in toxicology to like read this and figure out what the heck it is because there is basically 22 prohibited compounds um, within a red list material. And you're like, okay, that's not so hard, 22. I just gotta check for those. I can memorize that in like half an hour and be done. No, because chemical engineers combine and recombine things in so many different ways that it's really, really hard to trace. You know, for example, PVC, which is what is probably used in most of your piping and mine and everybody's. That's bad stuff because it, um, it biodegrades into dioxin, um, but figuring, but that stuff is, is combined with so much stuff in so many different ways, it's hard to track. Um, quickly, we'll talk about, well, do I have enough time? Yeah, quickly talk about biodiversity. We like biodiversity, I have beehives now on the roofs of my buildings. Um, we have this major pollinator problem, like the, like the butterflies have stopped going to Mexico. Um, it's like taking them too long. And so you wanna have these like places for pollinators like butterflies and bees and whatnot to land. So we have um, all of my landscape has to have a couple of pollinator friendly plants in there. And we have some beehives on my roof. These are totally not my beehives because mine isn't as pretty. Um, so I stole this from one of my competitors. <laughs> this is Boston Properties. Um, but ours are fine, but it's like, come on, this is a super nice roof. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, so yeah, and we're trying to grow our beehive roof as well as roof gardens. People, that's a new thing with the fancy tech executive chefs. They wanna like grow their own food on site. Um, and so that's a definitely a new roof, a uh, new real estate trend as well. Um, in addition to living walls, which you'll, there's like a couple restaurants in Culver City that do this where you can like cl clip this off and it's on your plate for dinner. Um, another, and it's, it has some impact on cleaning the air, although that, not that much. Oh, this is my, this is my beehive. So, um, and the reason I like this picture is because does anybody, can anybody recognize who that woman is? This is Blondie, um, who uh, had her album release party, and you know, she's a major punk um, rock artist. Uh, her album is called The Pollinator to like raise awareness for colony collapse disorder. This is my building in, um, in Hollywood. It was funny because I was on vacation with my family and I was getting all these calls like, we need the beekeeper to show up on, on Monday. And I was like, why? Like, have the bees swarmed? Did they sting somebody? And they're like, just get the beekeeper there. And it was because he was supposed to win all the album pictures with Blondie. <laughs> Celebrities like bees too. Uh, it's funny because Fender Guitar is a, is a tenant there and Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers is a major beekeeper and he was like stoked about it. I was like, all right. Um, and now the next thing we're getting into is like our supply chain. Like real estate, like if you, like electronics, like Apple knows who makes every single component in this phone. 
because um, they have to because they get sued about it all the time. Um, real estate, this never happens. Um, clothing, most of the clothing, your clothing manufacturers actually know the factory where these stuff is made and where the cotton is grown and all that. We have no idea in real estate and we're just getting into this now through the embodied carbon of our building materials um, and like m half of a building's ish in its first 30 years carbon emissions come from the upfront carbon that went into the building materials. The other half is the energy, but half of it is the carbon in the building materials and we have no idea how to deal with any of this. So this is the right now thing that's happening. Where is your cement made? Where is your steel made? Where is your concrete? Where is your glass coming from and how is it made? Um, so that is something I'm grappling with really, this was the emails I was sending right before I started doing this talk, was trying to figure out this for um, some of our new developments. We want to reduce this. I think that there's a level at which like the, the getting it 15 to 20% reduced actually isn't that hard and the rest will be, we're going to need new engineering, new, m new materials. How do I, you know, I tried out a concrete that you grow with algae at room temperature instead of firing it at a jillion degrees. Sadly, it didn't actually look that good after it was installed, but the point was I tried. Um, these are things that we're trying to work on. Um, and that's about it. So that, I wanted to leave like a couple minutes for questions. We're right close to the hour. Does anybody have anything for me? Anybody, anybody? Yes. You mentioned your, bit, your uh, building is self-operated, so you don't use unions for operating engineers? Uh, no, our engineers are union. They are union. So when we say we operate themselves, like Kilroy is the owner and Kilroy is the manager, but we sub out engineering, janitorial, security, parking, landscaping, all those people, we hire those trades. And depending on those cities, like our engineers um, are all union folk. And then the janitors are, in LA and San Francisco and San Diego, not in Silicon Valley, and then they are in Seattle. It depends on the it depends on the region. In the major cities, everybody's union. You kind of it's not worth getting picketed. I mean, so we're yeah union. Did that answer? Yeah, but just because we have a couple engineers, I think are actually on our own staff. That some of the chiefs are, but most of the other guys are. I be. I be W E W. I'm messing that up anyway. But yes, they're union. Other questions? Yes. So, uh, going back to the transit uh, um, problem, you mentioned a lot of good points about uh, parking spaces and the effect of EVs on parking. Yes. But what do you think other effects of autonomous vehicles or uh, electrification in terms of the building um, or landscape design in general? Not Right, so do we need parking spaces in front of our buildings at all, or can I use that for landscape is a major thing. It's also we worry that that autonomous vehicles are going to just, if, if everybody starts owning their autonomous vehicle, right, like what would be, you know, we already, people in L.A. drive hours and hours. I have somebody who I work with who drives two and a half hours each way. Um, like how much more is that going to happen if I can roll out of bed at four in the morning, go and pass out in my car and drive three hours to work? And then you lose, you know, you lose the, the pedestrian neighborhood of the people walking in and biking <coughs> in. So we really worry about that in terms of the d destruction of the urban fabric of the neighborhood because we, we want to be in vibrant places where people want to work and if they all become ghost towns. I mean, have anybody's been to like, I'll give an example, which is um, downtown St. Louis, right? Used to be Missouri. Used to be this vibrant, everybody was there walking around. It was great. And then the malls came in. And it's funny because now those are big destroyed people are moving back. But there was a while where like it was a ghost town. Nobody wanted to be there anymore because everybody was doing their shopping elsewhere. Is that going to happen to downtown LA, to downtown San Francisco, to downtown Seattle? We don't know. And so like maybe we're not investing in real estate in the right place. It will be great for the next 10 years. It's going to take about 30 years, right? We've, the projections we've been given for autonomous vehicles to get to 85% saturation. Um, there's an issue like, for example, I have two kids and like, they have car seats of different weights, like it's hard to do Uber in that situation. Um, so like once it gets to that, that like 30 year mark, then what happens? Like I said, we own our assets 50 years, 75 years. So yeah, it is, it is something that we really worry about. In terms of landscape design, it's just can we have more landscape? So we are right now already taking away surface parking to put in more landscape and like, but people like curbside restaurant stuff. So like my restaurant is here and then you have the picnic tables on the sidewalk, we like that. And if I don't have to use that area for parking, that's great. So. What about general land use in terms of distribution of, uh, let's say, uh, 
residential areas mm-hmm. or, or uh, office areas? Or right. So we, it's a, well, it's a big topic. Um, the, because as you know, we have this major housing problem. We're mostly an office company. And so where we're building residential is on mixed use campuses, these sort of live, work, play situations. So like our, our, we have one in Hollywood right now, the old Columbia Square, the old Columbia Broadcasting Studios. Um, and then a new one is opening in San Diego and then probably another one in Hollywood. Definitely another one in Hollywood that's been announced. Um, so the problem with residential is that residential is the least lucrative thing you can build on a piece of land um, because of how property tax, income tax works, which is why every single neighborhood says, yes, yes, we know we need more housing, but don't put it here. Um, and that is one of the reasons that residential is really difficult to do. We don't, we're, not a, we're not a residential REIT. There's many residential REITs that do that all the time. Um, but that's one of the major sort of land use things. I mean, what we believe in, we believe in density. We believe in um, you know, having a mixture of amenities all close together to help people not have to leave their area in a car. Um, but yeah, that to me is the majorest land use problem is that A, you have NIMBYism, like you don't want people moving in. And B, people don't want to build it anyway because the neighborhood doesn't want it and the builder doesn't want it because it's how you make the least amount of money, which is why we're in our housing crisis. So it is something I think about a lot. Um, and that is the fundamental reason why it's happening. Like if you could make a ton of money making residential, you'd think we would have enough houses. But it's the fact that it's, it's not the greatest way to make money, um, for either for the city or for the builder. That is why there's not that much of it. Which is kind of depressing, but you know, people are working on it. All right, any other questions for me? I'm easy to find, you can LinkedIn me. Um, and then there's the Killer Green Twitter stream, and I think I put at the end, ooh, too much fun with this clicker. Um, yeah, you can email me here if you have any questions, or tweet at me, or whatever you young folk like doing, so. Um, yeah. Uh, since most of the students here are civil engineers, mm -hmm. how a civil engineer can contribute to oh, yeah. the red list uh, uh, item that you mentioned? Right. Uh, developing sustainable material versus, I don't know, sustainable concrete or yeah. other totally. material related or construction related? Yeah, so what our civil engineers we typically rely on is water problems, right? So our civil engineers are the folks that need to deal with um, erosion control, how we're not going to, like, for example, when you build in Seattle, like, they are really care a lot about their salmon. Um, and the problem is with the Seattle, the way that the Seattle municipal water system is set up, like, everything just drains right to the their water source. And so um, civil engineers there need to be very, very, very good about how, what happens when rain falls on a site. Um, and so how stormwater is captured, filtered, reused, bioswales, all that good stuff, like, uh, sorry, I'm just clicking through this whole presentation like 800 times. Um, but like these, for example, here, these are all bioswales. So all of these planters here are actually, are, are there not decoratively, they're, they're, they're a rainwater capture. And then the pavers are permeable slightly to allow a lot of catchment. So that's, um, and that's hard. And civil engineers typically like to just like stick it all in a retention tank, hold it for 72 hours, which is what you have to do, and just discharge it, which is like boring. Um, so we would, I would love more innovation within that. Um, and then when we talk about the carbon of the building materials, I think civil will have a lot to say in that because they deal with the form work, you know, how everything is originally excavated and, um, and shored up to be able to build on top of. And so where they are okay with concrete and where they are okay with steel being a little more innovative is really gonna impact the overall carbon of a building. It's not in the furniture, right? It's not in the paint. It's in like the big structural stuff. And the civil engineer and the structural engineer are the two that decide that. So, lots of impact. All right, thanks again for- Sure, and then I'll get back on time. Thank you, everybody. And here's, here's me.